Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop, where today we're going to build an American classic, the TV tray table. They're a lot of fun to build. In fact, you may want to build several. I'll show you how next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. No, this is not the set for Leave it to Beaver. A friend of mine collects TV tray tables, and she brought a few out so I could show you. Look at this one. Looks like a scene of ancient Rome under a lacquer finish, although it does seem a bit unsteady. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, this one couldn't be simpler. A wood base and a top of simulated wood. I kind of like this one. More of a contemporary version. Nice and sturdy, light wood, and a surface that's easy to clean. Check these out. She bought these at a flea market. Now, each tray has a painted scene of fruit. Almost too good to use, but nice and sturdy. Now, when you think of classic TV tray tables, this one says it all. A tube steel base, a pressed steel tray. It says 1950s, TV dinners, and bring on the Ed Sullivan Show. Well, I think there's plenty of inspiration here for us to go back to the shop and build our own. Dinner is served. Now, if you build one of these, you won't miss a second of the New Yankee Workshop as you view it from your favorite television chair. Now, after looking at all the different tray tables, I incorporated the features that I thought worked best in ours. There's no stretcher across the middle of the X brace, just one at the bottom so nothing gets in the way as you sit under the tray. Up at the top, there are two stretchers with this nylon webbing in between, which restricts how far the X brace can open, yet it makes it very easy to fold up and store. Now, the tray itself has a couple good sized handles which makes it easy to carry around. And underneath, there's no clips or obstructions to get in the way. So you can use it just as an ordinary tray. The wood I chose was mahogany. And the surface of the tray is a high pressure laminate. And I know what you're thinking. The simulated leather look, it's awful. The design committee hates it. Hey, I made a mistake. So today, we'll use basic white. How's that? Now, if you'd like to build one of these, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now, before we do any woodworking, I want to take a minute to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. Now, here at the shop, I wear ear protection, and, of course, the most important safety rule, safety glasses. Let's get started building the tray. Here are the four pieces for the frame, two wider pieces for the ends, and narrower pieces for the front and back. Now, I'm going to join the pieces at the corner with what's known as a glue joint. Its shape allows a lot of glue surface area, and when you have a piece like the front and back, which is end grain, it makes a much stronger joint. I mill that joint using my router shaper table, which I've equipped with a shaper bit that has three cutters in the profile of that glue joint. Now, I've taken the time to adjust the height of the cutter so that it's perfectly centered on the thickness of my wood, and I've adjusted the rib fence so that it just nips the edge of it. Now, for the front and back pieces, I'm going to have to use my miter gauge. And I want to put in one piece as a backer to prevent chip out, and then both the front and back pieces at the same time, and clamp those in place. OK, 
Okay, now we'll just flip the pieces end for end and mill the other end. Well, let's see how we did. We'll just dry fit these pieces together. That's good. I've set my compass for an inch and three quarter radius for the outside corners. Let's do the layout for the inside cuts. Using the front or back piece flush to the end, I put a mark on the inside. Then using a combination square set at a half inch, I'll scribe a line point to point. And then with the compass set at a half inch, mark the inside radius. Now I'll make the cuts over at the bandsaw, being sure to leave the line. Then I'll fine tune them back at the drum sander. Now we're going to change the diameter of the drum sander to get those tight inside corners. With the frame set in some clamps but no glue yet and some scraps to give support so that as I push down on the top of the frame it won't slip, I'm going to round over the inside edge with my router which I've equipped with a half inch radius round over bit. Well, after changing to a quarter inch slot cutting bit, which will give me a groove about three eighths of an inch deep, I'm going to run a groove around the inside edge of the tray frame to receive the field. This piece of plywood will become the substrate for the high pressure laminate. It's important to round over these corners so that it'll fit into the groove properly. The next thing I want to do is attach the high pressure laminate to the substrate. And to do that, I'm going to use a contact adhesive so I've opened the door for plenty of ventilation. I'm going to apply the adhesive to both pieces, let it dry, and then stick them together. And I'm also going to wear a respirator mask because this stuff is pretty potent. Okay, let's see if this glue has dried. When it's just tacky, like it is now, we're ready to set the two pieces together. I'm going to take the plywood substrate and set it on the laminate, put it in the center, and then flip it back over and use this tool, a J roller. Starting at the center of the piece, I want to push to the outer edge to remove any air bubbles. To trim the laminate, I'm going to use what's known as a laminate trimmer. It's very much like a router, a little smaller motor and a smaller base. I've installed a laminate trimming bit, which has a ball bearing which will ride against the substrate, and the cutter will remove the excess laminate. Before I apply any glue to the joints and to the tray, I want to do one more dry fit because once the glue is set in place, I won't be able to make any further adjustments. 
Okay, that's going to be fine. I think we can glue it up. I'm applying glue to both the joint and the groove because once the plywood is set in place, it'll help hold the tray all together. Now with everything perfectly positioned, I'll clamp it together using just these two clamps. Now we'll just set this aside to dry and start working on the handles. The handles will be cut from these pieces. The radius on the outside is one and a half inches and the radius on the inside is one inch. To round over the edges of the handle, once again I'm turning to my router, which I've equipped with a half inch radius round over bit. Well, a little more sanding on these handles and I think we'll call it a day. Tomorrow we'll finish the tray, attach these handles, and of course we have the stand to build. Well, after setting in the clamps overnight, the glue has dried and I can remove the tray. Now, the first thing that I want to do today is round over the top and bottom edges of the tray. I'm going to use my router again, which is still set up with the half inch radius round over bit, except this time I've lowered the base of the router a bit so that I'm only using a portion of that bit. Now the handles for the tray are attached with some screws and then the screw heads are covered with some mahogany plugs. I've laid out the location of the holes on the underside of the tray and I've set up my drill press with a combination drill countersink bit. It works great. Now the counter bore is about a quarter of an inch deep. The pilot drill goes all the way through. I'm going to put a little dab of glue over each pilot hole and then take a handle and clamp it in place. Flip the piece over and install a couple inch and three quarter screws. Of course, having a little pencil mark makes it a little bit easier to locate the handle. To make the plugs, I'm going to use my plug cutting set. I have a whole bunch with different diameters. And what they are are wood cutting bits that have a hole in the center. So as you spin it or plunge it into a piece of wood, it produces a plug. Today I want to use the 3 8 inch diameter size, so I'll just chuck that in the drill press. I'll just use a piece of scrap mahogany here and cut four plugs. Now 
Now using a small screwdriver, I just stick it in and pry on it a little bit and it pops it loose. And I'll apply some glue to the counter bore and to the plug itself. And we'll just set it in there. And after the glue dries, I'll sand it flush. Well, now for the stand. The first thing that I need are four pieces cut at a 23 and a half degree angle at the top and at the bottom. To do that, I've set up my miter box, swinging it to one side to 23 and a half degrees. I'll trim one end of a piece. Then slide it down to my stop, which I've preset for the correct length, and make the cut on the other end. The next thing to do is drill a 3 16 inch diameter hole in the center of each leg for the rivets that hold it together. Take a look at this detail. The X braces are connected with three stretchers, one at the bottom and two at the top. Now they're not drilled all the way through. They actually sit in a counter bore, which is a half inch deep. To make the counter bore, I'm going to use a 7 8 inch Forstner bit. Now this little specialty hand plane does a great job knocking off the corners. After that, I'll sand the pieces smooth. Now to form the X brace, I'm going to rivet the pieces together, but first I want to make sure I get them oriented in the right position. The outer leg, which is towards me, has one hole for a stretcher at the top. The inner leg has a hole at the top and at the bottom. So now I want to hold those together and use a brass machine bolt as a rivet. The brass is decorative, plus it's soft enough to turn into a rivet. First I'll put a washer on, slip it in from the outside through the leg, then add two washers so that there's no friction between the two pieces. Slide it through the other leg. And finally, one more washer. And then bring the whole assembly over to this heavy steel plate. And using a ball-peen hammer, I'll peen over the end of the bolt to form a rivet. Okay, that's going to work great. Now the stretchers for my project are 7 8 inch diameter dowels. And because I built my project out of mahogany, I can't just go down to a woodworker store and easily find mahogany dowels. So I'm making my own. I started out with a square piece of stock, about an inch square, and then I knocked off the corners so there'd be a little less material to remove. I'm going to start the turning by using a gouge, just roughing it out round. Okay, now that's pretty close. What I want to do now is make a couple marks because over the length of the dowel I'm most interested in the last two and a half inches because this is where I'll be cutting it. It has to be exactly seven eighths of an inch to fit into those counter bores. Now I'll return to my gouge and start fine-tuning it. Well, 
Well, now I'm getting real close. So I'm going to switch over to this scraper to make the final pass. That should do it. Now I'll do the other end. Okay, with both ends nearly perfect, I can just sweeten up the middle. Okay, now a little final sanding. Now we'll just cut them to length. Now to assemble the base, some glue in the counter bores and on the end of the dowel. And we'll just slip that in. Okay. okay, now for some added protection to secure the joint, I'm going to put a one inch brad at each location. Okay, well I'll let this dry. I won't bother to put the straps on now until after I put the finish on. Before I put a protective finish on this piece, I'm applying a little bit of stain. Mahogany tends to be a little red if you just put a clear finish on it. So I want to have it a little browner. So I'm using a walnut colored stain. And after that dries, I'll put on a couple coats of polyurethane. With the stain dry, I'm now applying two to three coats of a satin finish polyurethane. And that'll give me a nice tough finish. Because I have a feeling this piece is going to be subject to a lot of abuse. Well, now I'm ready to attach the webbing, which will keep the top of the base from spreading apart too far. So with the base upside down on the workbench, I'm going to wrap the webbing around the dowel. Now, this webbing I picked up at a local fabric shop. It's just a nylon webbing. Let me put about three staples to attach the end. Now I want to wrap the webbing around the dowel. And on this side, where the legs are closest together, I'm about an inch and a half from the leg. When I bring it over to the other side and wrap it around, I want to slide the webbing over an additional three quarters of an inch to account for the overlap of the leg, so the webbing will be straight. Okay, that's not going to go anywhere. Now one more additional thing keep the webbing from loosening up as the table is folded, I'm going to put a little bit of glue right along the top edge. Well, there it is. Ready for an evening of TV viewing and munching. I think I'll start out with the Masterpiece Theater, then move on to the New Yankee Workshop, and finish up with that classic, This Old House.